the opening scene features a farewell party being held at the residence of an astronaut named Luke Graham. He is celebrating his upcoming journey to Mars. All of his loved ones and acquaintances are present to bid him goodbye. One of his colleagues named Jim McConnell, who had been preparing for the same mission, is sadly unable to join Luke due to the recent death of his wife. The scene then fast forwards by 13 months, where Luke and his fellow crew members have successfully touched down on Mars. Meanwhile, Luke's other colleagues, including Jim, are watching on from the World Space Station's command center, maintaining communication with the crew. Shortly after the arrival on Mars, the team comes across a strange, bright structure. They suspect that this formation may be an outgrowth, originating from an underground geothermal water column, which could prove valuable for future human colonization plans. As a result, they relay this discovery to the command center, and then make their way towards the formation to conduct further investigation. As they step out of their spacecraft, the astronauts hear an unusual sound. It sounds like this. Where are you? But they dismiss it as interference coming from their robots. They then continue walking and soon come across a towering formation resembling a mountain. The crew checks on their radar and learns that it is metallic. Following this, they decide to enhance the radar power, prompting the sand beneath their feet to shift. For the first few seconds, the crew does not pay much attention to this phenomenon and continues to record the unexpected transformation in their device. But just then, a massive vortex appears out of nowhere and launches a sudden attack on the astronauts. This sadly results in the demise of everyone except Luke. And that's not even all. The vortex emits an immensely powerful electromagnetic pulse that causes extensive damage to the spacecraft's electronic equipment. Once everything settles down, the formation finally reveals itself. It is an enormous, humanoid face, indicating that Mars was once inhabited by Homo sapiens. Meanwhile, a shocked and injured Luke somehow manages to transmit a message to the World Space Station. Tom DeLong has been here he says. Upon receiving this transmission, Jim becomes worried and approaches his superior, Ray. He proposes that they immediately organize a rescue mission. However, Ray is skeptical about the idea, as they aren't even sure what's lurking on Mars. Perhaps Luke might not survive the night, after all. Ray also doesn't trust Jim due to his withdrawal from the previous expedition. Hearing all of this, one of the astronauts present in the room, Woody Blake, comes forward and defends Jim. He says that the poor guy was only caring for his ill wife, and that is something every husband would prioritize. Moreover, it was Jim and his wife who extensively studied and designed the Mars mission, making him the most knowledgeable about the planet. This argument finally convinces Ray, and as a result, a rescue spacecraft, comprising a team of four individuals, sets off for Mars. The crew members are Woody, his wife, Terry Fisher, Jim, and a technician named Phil Oilmeyer. The primary objective of the mission is to investigate the tragic events and secure the safe return of Luke. As they approach Mars' orbit, they realize that the mysterious interference is still there. They also notice three burial mounds, which they assume to be the resting places of their fallen crew members. Soon after, a magnetic storm engulfs the planet, rendering visibility impossible for the astronauts. But despite this, Ray sends a video message granting them permission to land on Mars. Woody goes to share the news to Jim, but to his surprise, the latter is watching a family movie, reminiscing about the cherished moments with his late wife. An astronaut would never be doing that at an important moment like this. That's some Hollywood bullshit. After this, the team begins the preparations to land on Mars, but as they are doing so, a swarm of small meteorites suddenly collides with their spaceship, resulting in damage to its hull and causing an injury to Phil's arm. This incident also leads to an atmosphere leak. The crew swiftly responds by conducting repairing procedure, diligently searching for the source of the damage. But the breach is too small to be visually detected. It appears as if they are going to crash. But Terry comes up with an excellent idea. She squeezes a packet of juice, allowing it to float towards the breach and seep through, thereby identifying its location. With this, Woody suits up to venture into outer space and uses a liquid substance to mend the breach. The very incident puts Jim at the brink of asphyxiation, but he somehow manages to survive. Unbeknownst to the crew, the fuel tanks of their spacecraft have also sustained damage due to the recent collision. As a result of this, when they ignite the main engines, the fuel leaks into space and explodes, resulting in the destruction of the spaceship. Hence, with no alternatives left, the crew is forced to suit up and make their way towards the resupply module that was left from the first mission. It appears to be orbiting Mars in close proximity. Unfortunately, the circumstances are not in the crew's favor, as the resupply module is moving at a slightly lower orbit and a faster pace than the crew. Realizing that time is running out, Woody utilizes all 
all the fuel in his rocket to propel himself towards the module. He successfully attaches a tether to it, but loses his grip during this process, causing him to descend into the Martian atmosphere. Panicked, Carrie disconnects her tether and goes after her husband. She is adamant on saving him at all costs, despite the rest of the crew saying that it's dangerous. But just as she reaches a bit further, Woody selflessly removes his helmet, sacrificing himself to ensure her survival. Way to scar her for life, jackass. Seeing this, Terry mourns for a while before returning to her friends. In the next scene, the crew finally reaches the Martian's surface and begins repairing the Earth Returning Vehicle, or ERV, using the motherboards that they have brought with them. They also explore the first spaceship in which their former crew had arrived and discover that the living quarters are still intact. Jim heads to the greenhouse section and is astounded to find that all the plants are thriving. As he removes his helmet and catches a reflection in a water-filled bucket, he notices someone holding an axe behind him. Jim quickly turns around, only to discover that it is Luke. The latter appears hostile at first, as he has been on this planet alone for months. But when Jim utters the names of his wife and son, he calms down. Luke appears to be affected by the isolation and the loss of his crew, causing him to exhibit some signs of mental strain. Nonetheless, he manages to convey the discoveries made by his team to the rescuers, including the colossal humanoid face. He proceeds to share that, during his solitary period, he tried his best to unravel the enigmatic nature of the structure. Luke then presents the rescuers with his most significant discovery, a recording capturing the distinctive noise heard in the vicinity of the formation. Through months of analysis, Luke has deciphered the sound as a three-dimensional representation of human-like DNA, intricately mapped on a spatial coordinate system. He theorizes that it serves as a distinctive signature left by someone. After some hours of research, Jim and his crew learn that the mysterious signals they have encountered are not merely signatures, but rather an interactive prompt. This prompt requires the input of a missing pair of chromosomes, essential for completing the human DNA sequence. Basically, it appears to be a test left behind by the creators, and the previous crew perished due to an incorrect response to it. Jim strongly believes that they must fulfill the sequence to pass this test. As a result, they deploy a rover to transmit the completed signal using radar. The plan works, and an opening materializes on the side of the formation, emitting a strange bright light. While Phil stays behind to repair the ERV, the remaining crew members decide to investigate more. As soon as they walk inside the formation, the entrance gets sealed, causing them to lose contact with Phil. Not long after, they realize that the atmosphere here is similar to that of Earth. So, they remove their helmets and start breathing normally. That was risky. As they proceed, they enter a spacious, dimly lit chamber that astonishingly projects a three-dimensional representation of the solar system. The crew members are left in shock at what they are witnessing. After all these years of hard work and research, they have finally discovered that aliens indeed exist. Shortly after, a holographic figure resembling a Martian appears and starts giving a silent explanation. It reveals that in the distant past, Mars was a thriving planet with abundant life and water. However, that changed one day when Mars was struck by a catastrophic asteroid, completely destroying its ecosystem. The surviving Martians were compelled to evacuate their home planet in search of new settlements. They also sent their own life forms to ancient Earth in the form of microscopic bacteria. Over the course of billions of years, these life forms developed into plants and animals. Eventually, humans were born and started ruling planet Earth, just like the Martians had hoped. This means that the present-day humans and all the other living organisms on Earth are actually the sperm of Mars. We are the aliens. Whoa! After the presentation ends, the holographic figure extends its hand to the astronauts, affirming that they belong to the same species. As the image of the Martian figure slowly dissipates, it invites one of the astronauts to their newfound planetary destinations. Meanwhile, Phil somehow contacts the crew and reveals that a deadly storm is coming their way. If they don't leave on time, they might become stranded or even die here. This worries the crew and they prepare to leave, but Jim announces that he will stay. He has decided to follow the Martians on their journey to another galaxy. The rest of the crew members are left in utter shock, but they know that it is Jim's dream to tour the galaxy. Prior to their, depar <laughs> Prior to their departure, Terry presents Jim with a rocket pendant that belonged to Woody, symbolizing their enduring friendship. Luke and Terry then make their way out of the formation, while Jim stands within a cylindrical structure that undergoes a transformation into a capsule-like container. At last, he is gently lifted into outer space. Jim knows that from this point onward, his life is uncertain and that he is completely reliant on the Martians. But after the death of his wife, he hasn't been quite the same either. He is getting to live his dream of traversing space, and if this is the way he is going to die, 
It is the right way. At least he doesn't have to wait long to meet his wife. Assuming that aliens and heaven are real, Jim getting greedy. After a while, his capsule begins filling with a clear liquid, so Jim holds his breath for as long as possible. But at one point, he succumbs to the need for air and breathes, and to his astonishment, he is able to breathe within the liquid. This discovery brings a smile to Jim's face as he realizes that he is in an entirely new form of existence. Flooded with all the good memories of the past, he bids one final farewell to everyone. In the final scene, as the crew members are taking off, they notice Jim's Martian craft fly past them at a speed of hundreds of times greater than their RV. It is venturing deep into the vast expanse of deep space. The movie ends as the crew sends their best wishes to Jim, hoping for his safe journey ahead.